Hello, and welcome to Talk Julia. My name is David Amos. My name is Randy Davila. Randy, Julia is 10 years old this week. Which right. is, uh, <laughs> it's, <laughs> That's pretty, it's awesome. Yeah, it's pretty kind of in- interesting to think about. I'm always feel like I'm a little shocked whenever I hear stuff like that. For example, like Python is now what, like 30 years old, which is kind <laughs> yeah. of crazy. And Julia, you know, 10 years old. There was a really nice post on the Julia Language website's blog called Why We Use Julia 10 Years Later. And this is kind of a throwback to this now famous blog post they published. It was exactly 10 years ago on Monday, Valentine's Day. So Valentine's Day of 2012, I guess, they posted this Why We Created Julia which, you know, is this famous post introducing the Julia project to the world. And they say, you know, at this point, we've moved well past the ambitious goals set out in the original blog post. And it's now being used by hundreds of thousands of people. It's taught at hundreds of universities and whole companies are being formed, building their software stacks on Julia. So they reached out and asked a bunch of people in the Julia community to share, you know, their experience and some reflections on the last 10 years. And there's, I think, 70 people that responded. No, more than that, 97, 97 people here now. It's a lot of fun to go through and read and see what people mention and talk about. And Honestly, they're... I'd like to also add my own personal feelings about this. Sure. So I was exposed to Julia first in 2013-ish. Back then, I immediately loved the way the syntax looked and the coloring choices. I loved the Julia logo. Everything about it was cool to me back then. But that was before I seriously started to program anything. I just thought it looked cool. Five years later or so, I started to try to program in Julia. It was so natural back then, but there were still packages that were not developed the way that I would want them to be based off of my experience in Python. It was a strange time to be learning it when I was kind of isolated and the community wasn't exploding like it is now. And I think back to those times and it almost uh, made me love it more that I was isolated and got to see, oh, this package is being updated. Oh, this change is being made. This And every time there was changes made, they weren't changes that I disagreed with. I looked at like the new version of Julia and I think that's that's exactly what it should be. I, lo- I love that. It's really cool to see how far it's come in my experience. It's grown so much and I, I'm so excited to see where it goes from here on out. Yeah, me too. I'm, I'm looking forward to the next 10 years and beyond of, of Julia. So Randy, this week you and I Kind of, we got together and we decided we were going to look at maybe some machine learning stuff in in Julia, and in particular, we decided to look at, you know, how you do reinforcement learning with Julia and what exists out there uh, in the ecosystem. And uh, it's been, you know, a lot of fun and really interesting. There's some really cool stuff out there. Uh, so, Randy, do you want to kind of kick us off on on that? Yeah. So, reinforcing learning is a subfield of machine learning and is different from what I would call the two standard machine learning fields that most people know about. That is supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Reinforcement learning is just as old as each of the other two fields. However, it feels new. And the reason why I say it feels new is that a lot of really cool advances have happened in the past few years with reinforcement learning. So supervised machine learning You are training an algorithm on labeled data, meaning that you have measurements and labels for each of those measurements, and you use various algorithms to learn the correct labels given those labels. And then you try to make predictions on outside data. Unsupervised learning, you can typically think of as clustering, where you have data without labels and you're trying to cluster them into similar groups based off of the features that have been measured. These are typically taught at the undergraduate level and are kind of standard machine learning fields that you must learn if you're going to be a practicing machine learning expert or a scientist. Reinforcement learning feels distinct from these in that you learn the labels. Now, that might seem, how is that different than supervised machine learning? Well, in order for you to gain the the, the labels for your features, you have to experience actions. So by choosing actions, you learn the labels. I highly recommend the classic book of Sutton and Bartow called Reinforcement Learning and Introduction. This is the go-to standard book, in my opinion, for learning this topic. This book covers both what are called tabular and deep reinforcement learning 
ideas. And to illustrate these ideas, imagine that you are what's called an agent. You could be playing uh, tic-tac-toe or checkers against another opponent. You have to sequentially make choices based off of the observations in front of you. And this over time will build up an experience that you've had where at the end of that experience, you see, oh, I won or I lost. Do you get rewarded or not? Yeah. So that sequence is called a trajectory. It's a sequence of observing the state, making an action, getting reward, state, action, reward, state, action, reward. Through this process, playing a game over and over again, you build up rewards for the actions that you take. So you can build this data up and then fine tune your actions to increase your reward. Yeah, I like to think of it as like the difference between teaching a child the words for things, right? Learning to read in some sense. They start with like very basic things like here's a picture of an apple and here's the word apple above it. And you start to like, it's like that labeled data, right? They kind of start to make that association versus something like when they run experiments, maybe with like monkeys or something, right? They're trying to understand maybe something about like a monkey's behavior or their cognition or something like that. And they devise an experiment where they want to teach it to perform some actions. So how do they do that? They like the monkey does something, uh, they present it with some choice or some, you know, something to do and it does something. And then it, it either gets like a reward or does not get like, you know, it gets a little treat or it does, doesn't get a little treat out of that. So I don't know. That's how he's in my mind. I kind of picture like, no, that, that, yeah, that works. I yeah. Mean, I think that, again, it's the sequential nature of it. It um, is, yeah. They do that over and over again with the monkeys, right? And then eventually right. they start to learn that, okay, if I do these sequences of actions, then I get I get these rewards. Right, and that actually, that's a good segue to the distinction between what's called tabular reinforcement learning and deep reinforcement learning. So if you can enumerate all the possible sequences and the, the rewards for those sequences, if you can enumerate them, you can put them in a table, mm -hmm. and then it does feel very much like supervised machine learning where you have yeah. sequences of steps and rewards that you have learned over time, but you eventually fill up the table and it, it feels like supervised learning. Um, and this is different than when you cannot enumerate all the possibilities, like in the, the idea of the monkey, like you have no idea what the monkey is gonna do. Is it gonna act this way or act this way based off of, right. So in that case, you need something else. You need something to approximate the rewards based off of the actions for this monkey, which is a function. And these functions, the best that we can approximate them with are what are called deep networks. So yeah. deep reinforcement learning is, is approximating this function and using something like stochastic gradient descent or something like that to optimize your, your, your network that's, this, that's going to either predict your reward or predict a, a probability of an action that you should take. Right. And that's kind of the state of the art right now. And brings me to a link that I want all of the listeners to go watch on YouTube uh, from DeepMind. So there's this documentary called AlphaGo, the movie by DeepMind, that uh, tells the story about the first computer program to beat a professional Go player. Now, Go is an ancient game that's played a lot um, in Eastern countries. And it's one of the most popular games in the world. And it's one of the most complex games. People didn't believe that a computer would be able to beat a professional Go player for years back then before this was done. And reinforcement learning together with deep neural networks led to a program called AlphaGo Alpha that beat this man named Lee Sedol, a very impressive man. When you watch this documentary, and you look at Lee Sedol and his focus when he's playing, you get the sense of how good he is and how like smart he is with this, with playing this game. And it's incredible to see how this program has learned through playing itself and playing other like examples of Go games, learned to beat this guy. It's like one of my favorite documentaries. I have it playing a lot in the background when I'm programming just for like inspiration because the music is good, the commentary is good. Please go watch it. I'm an academic. I love working at universities, but if I was offered a job for DeepMind, I would take it in a heartbeat. <laughs> I love what they're doing, and I think it's the coolest um, group, and they're doing the, the coolest research to me. I don't know. I just, I, I'm not a lost words. I just love it. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> now, on that note, 
on my screen right now, I have pulled up this Julia Reinforcement Learning.org page, which has a library called Reinforcement Learning.jl. This, this uh, Julia package has a lot of ways to experiment with reinforcement learning. If you scroll down to the bottom of this page, you'll see other Julia packages for reinforcement learning. In particular, you'll see an alpha0.jl package. Now I haven't mm. looked at this much myself, but alpha0 is a generalization of this AlphaGo program that I was just mentioning in that YouTube documentary. And I'm just excited to really start to explore all of these packages and to hopefully one day call myself a reinforcement learning researcher because I'm far from it, but I'm fascinated with it. On that note, David, I'm really curious to see what you learned about reinforcement learning that JL. Yeah. So the best place I think to start is on their website, juliareinforcementlearning.com or .org, I think. Uh, on their blog, they've got this blog post called An Introduction to Reinforcement Learning JL Design Implementations and Thoughts. And I didn't start here, but I kind of wish I had found this first before I started diving in because it answered a lot of questions that I had while I was kind of going through docs and, and looking through source code and stuff. But I guess to start it off, I should say, you know, what they kind of talk about as the purpose of their package. And it's really focusing on creating a collection of tools for learning and implementing reinforcement learning algorithms. The kind of the key difference that they highlight is that unlike many other existing packages that focus on deep reinforcement learning only, only they aim to build an ecosystem that solves many different kinds of tasks in reinforcement learning. And they talk about, for example, the tabular reinforcement learning, which Randy was talking about, deep reinforcement learning as well, but then also things like offline reinforcement learning, multi-agent reinforcement learning, and model-based reinforcement learning. So it's kind of a wider scope than a lot of other deep reinforcement learning packages have. And honestly, the way that they've set it up, it seems perfect for teaching. There's a chance this summer that I'll teach a course in reinforcement learning. And if I do, I'm probably going to use Julia. Awesome. Yeah, that'll be good. Uh, they talk about why they decided to use Julia for this package. Kind of the biggest reason uh, is because of Julia's multiple dispatch uh, system. And it makes the code very easy to read, understand, and to extend. And I got to say, just from playing around with it and seeing it a little bit, I completely agree. Like This seems like a really great example of where multiple dispatch really shines, which I can talk about a little bit later. But the general design is really simple which I think speaking to your thought about using it in education, it's very, very simple. It's so much simpler than like the open AI gym stuff. Not to say anything bad about open AI and gym and Python. No, It's just, it's a pain for students to use. I've tried it before and the success rate for students actually being able to install the packages correctly, it's been difficult. Yeah. And I think too, you know, with the open AI, if you want to create like a custom environment for this uh, deep learning project, then you have to create this like subclass of OpenAI's gym class. And there's all these things that have to have to happen. You know, for researchers or for professionals, this object-oriented approach is probably fine. And I know I didn't feel too much friction with it when when we were experimenting with it. But I, you know, for students, I feel like, you know, the, just the OOP sort of adds this additional layer of overhead for students. As opposed to something like this reinforcement learning.jl, it's really, it's just functions you're writing. You're just like, you have to write certain functions, create new methods basically for some functions that are already built in. So it's a little bit less on the, the programming knowledge, right? That I feel like right, you have, right. to have to kind of just jump in. And also just looking at this webpage that we're viewing, it's written beautifully. They put a lot of effort into this and you can it tell. They absolutely have. Yeah, the docs are definitely not perfect, which I don't think any open source project, probably no project ever <laughs> right. in the history of anything has perfect, perfect documentation. But it's it's good. Like it was enough to really get me started. And then this blog post in particular is a really nice just sort of introduction to it. But it talks about sort of the general workflow. And this is not necessarily a reinforcement learning.jl specific thing. This is just kind of the general workflow of any reinforcement learning project, but you have really two parts, right? You have your agent, which is what's actually performing actions and collecting rewards. And then you have the environment, which is where the actions interact with that environment and can change the state of the environment potentially. It right. doesn't necessarily have to, but can change the state. So the, the agent then can, you know, not only get a reward, but can observe like the action that I just did, how did that change the environment around me? So they 
implement this is sort of in the most general way, there's these two types. You have an abstract policy type, which is uh, a little bit more general than an agent, but really that's what's taking the actions. Right. And then you have this abstract ENV type, which is the environment that the actions are going to going to take place in. So it's a really simple sort of framework to start with that talks about, you know, sort of the general flow for some of these things and how it all works. And it all sort of comes down to at the most basic level, there's this run function. So you can create this method on this run function, then it takes a policy in an environment and then runs an experiment with it. And that's where you can do all the different things to set up the experiment and what's going on. So for example, when you would run, you could do things like you could like take an action, observe, you can reset the environment or terminate the environment. These are the types of things you would do and run, I'm assuming. Right, exactly. Yeah. Now you don't have to implement all this from scratch. This is just kind of in this document, they're going through like how this all works. So it's kind of giving you a, a, an overview in Julia code of kind of what's what's going on. You do not necessarily have to implement this like run function from scratch or anything, but you can if you want to extend it and add additional functionality to, to what's uh, built in. It's there for you to just extend. You start out by you know resetting your environment and then you have basically this while loop that just you know, as long as I'm not terminated yet, you know, keep doing the things that uh, that need to be done. In general, real world problems are not going to continue indefinitely. Absolutely. They're, they're, they're going to stop at some point. So I think if you scroll down a little bit, you might see that we can implement like a stop condition inside of the, the run method or the run function, right? Right. Yeah, that's what this is terminated function method is for. Uh, so you would do like, if it isn't terminated, yeah, then you have some kind of stopping condition. Uh, then it talks about a more specific type of policy called an agent. And the main difference there is an agent keeps track of its experiences in something that usually people call like an experience replay buffer. So as it's taking actions, it's collecting information about the state of the environment before it took the action, the action that it took, the state of the environment after it, and then you know the reward that you get. And it can store all of this in this uh, experience replay buffer. They call that in reinforcementlearning.jl specifically the trajectory, which is also the term you used earlier, Randy, and I know is used in the, the literature, right? But it's the sequence of these like observations. It's a sequence a sequence of triples. Yeah. State action reward, state action reward, state action reward. It's a sequence of triples that occurs as the agent is playing throughout the game. Yeah. And so it's also got its policy attached to that. So the agent, right, has two things. This policy, which is the thing that's actually doing the learning, and then the, the trajectory. So it's got this agent type built in, so you can create your own agent. And then it's also got the RL zoo package. It's got a whole bunch of different algorithms and agent types and stuff. Throughout this whole process of this agent interacting with an environment, there are moments you as a researcher or uh, as a student or whatever it is you're doing with reinforcement learning, you may want to collect information at certain times during this process, you know, plot it or store it somewhere. So there's this idea of these hooks that can hook into different steps in this sequence. And you can write functions then that hook into that particular stage and then something can happen. It can call a function that logs something, that plots something, whatever it is that needs to be done. So there's these different stages. There's like the pre-experiment stage right? That before the experiment has even really started, then there's the pre-episode stage, which is right before every new episode starts. There's a pre-act stage. So right before every action takes place, you can have something happen. And then there's like the post version of those. So there's a post-act stage, a post-episode and a post-experiment. So you can hook into all these things and have different things going on while the experiment is running. So it's a really flexible framework. There's a lot of really great information in this blog post. Some of this information, if not all of it, is kind of peppered throughout the documentation, but this was the nicest way to kind of see it all laid out for me to really wrap my head around like how this reinforcement learning jail works. So yeah, highly recommend looking at it. One of the things that I wanted to walk through real quick is the example that's on the homepage of the doc. There's a really simple example using what's called the cart pull environment. You can think of like a cart maybe on wheels or something, right? Just a flat cart. It can move in, you know, to the left or to the right. Those are the only two directions we're going to allow it to move. On top of the cart is a pole. The idea is to learn how to make movements with the cart left and right uh, to keep the pole balanced on top of the cart. 
And if the pole like falls down, if it gets below some certain angle, then it's okay, you failed and you, you start over and you keep doing this over and over again until you learn how to balance the pole for as long as, as possible. So that's, that's this cart pole environment. And the example they have is, is real simple. You start with using reinforcement learning and then you call the run function and you pass to it a policy. And so in this example, they're using the random policy. And what this is, is that every step, the agent is just going to pick a random action. And then there's the environment. And so there's already a built-in cart pull environment if you'd like to experiment with that. Then you give it a stop condition. And in this case, there's this specific type of a stopping condition called stop after step. And they're passing to that a thousand steps. So once a thousand steps through have gone, then it's going to terminate. And then at the end is this hook called total rewards per episode. And what that's going to do is keep track of all the rewards that it's gotten for each episode. And then at the end, we'll actually be able to use that to say, like, make a plot if we want to, to, to see that. So what I'm going to do is just copy and paste this code and drop it into a Julia REPL. So I'll start up Julia and I'll activate the environment that's got everything installed in it as long as I type activate <laughs> correctly and copy and paste that code into there and show you what the output looks like because it's really nice. So when I execute the run function, then it shows me this really cool little plot in my terminal that shows like the total reward per episode. So it's gone through, it's done, it's you know, a thousand steps and you can see this random agent, like sometimes it seemed to do okay, but you know, for the most part, it's just, it's kind of all over the place, mainly hanging down here in the, the low scores. But I love that it just gives you this little plot right out of the box, right, right after you, you run it. So that's, uh, that's super cool. But to dig into it a little bit, more deeply, I want to look at an example. So they've got some example experiments in their documentation, and they kind of show you some other features. So this one, we're looking at a basic DQN agent. So this is a deep Q network, and it's fine if you don't know exactly what that means, but it's a type of reinforcement learning algorithm. But what I wanted to highlight was this interface basically with this experiment. So you're creating a new method on this uh, experiment and inside of the function, then you basically set up everything you need for the experiment. So you create your environment and you need to create a policy using this agent type. And then you also set the stop condition inside of this function and then the, the hook that you want to use. And then you return a new experiment type that's been instantiated with your policy, your environment, the stop condition, the hook, and uh, and I think this is like a name or like a title that will be displayed. Yeah. So what I've done is I've taken this and copied it and put it into VS Code so that I can run this and show you what it does because this has a really nice output as well. I've got it in a file that I've called cartpool.jl. And then in my Julia REPL, I'm just going to include cartpool.jl. And then I create the experiment here. They're using EX equals, and then there's this E backtick and you could give it the name. So this is, I think like a, a lookup system they've got for, you can register essentially what you're doing when you create this experiment function. You're sort of like registering these different experiments that you can then reuse by using the syntax E backtick and then the values that you used when you created the experiment function. So here there's a Julia RL base DQN and, and cart pull. When you run that line, yeah, what happens is it gives you some information. So here it's telling me that, you know, okay, there's no GPU accessible. So it's defaulting back to the CPU, which I expected on my computer. And then it shows you the initial state and sort of configuration of everything that's uh, that's here. And it's got this really nice tree structure. So it's really nice to look at in the terminal and just see like, okay, what's the policy that's being used? What's my approximator look like and everything. So that's really nice. And then when you actually run it, you type run and then pass your experiment to it. So the run function, remember before we looked at it, you, you could pass to the run function, a policy, an environment, a stop condition and all that. But there's another version of run, another method where you, it just takes an experiment and then you can just pass the experiment to run there. And when you do that, it will run the experiment. So on my screen is a little progress bar that's shown up. So that's nice that that's just already built in. Yeah, so when it's done, then you get that plot of the total rewards per episode. So you can see how it did compared to the random agent. This one actually, so it started out doing horribly. And then about halfway through the experiment, it started getting good. And finally, it basically looks like it ma mastered it there at the end. It was able to keep the 
the pole balanced yeah. for several iterations. But besides the plot, it also then shows you like the final state of everything. So you can see the state of your environment and your agent and everything when the experiment finished running. So I really like that. There's like no extra steps you have to take. Just out of the box, you get all this useful output, these plots, everything there, which I feel like is a little bit different from the experience I have with some of the libraries in Python. There was always like more steps you had to take to kind of get to some of that stuff, right. and everything. So yeah, I think, you know, going back to what you're saying about, you know, teaching, there's a lot here that without doing anything other than just, you know, using reinforcement learning, you get all this really nice stuff, really nice interface and, and, you know, the plots and everything. Yeah. Super simple. I just, i I was really, really impressed with how simple everything was. And that kind of goes back to something in that blog post that we were looking at uh, before. At the very end of it, there's some thoughts and it talks about maybe some best practices around machine learning, reinforcement learning, and particular reinforcement learning.jl. And the very first one is to keep interfaces stupid, simple, and minimal. And I think they've done a good job of making everything about as simple as I could expect it to be, you know, from my perspective. That, and then just mention what they say here. It says, oh, so adding new APIs is cheap, but soon you'll be the only one that knows how to use them. <laughs> so, yeah. so keeping APIs as simple as possible and, and as simple and minimal as possible will force you to rethink your existing design and come up with a more natural one. And actually the multiple dispatch in Julia encourages you to generalize the interfaces as much as possible. So yeah, that ethos is very much ingrained in this reinforcement learning.jl. Uh, they're really tapping into multiple dispatch and making use of that, which in the end, I think just makes the experience of working with reinforcement.jl actually really, really nice. Yeah, this, I'm just thinking about, like, it's still up in the air if I'm, if I'm teaching this reinforcement learning course over the summer. Well, it's like half reinforcement learning. The other half is general deep learning. But for the reinforcement learning part, I'm really thinking I should use Julia instead. Yeah. And also, I wanted to to end the episode with mentioning what we'll what we plan on doing next week. Next week, we we want to look at flux.jl. Yeah. And I do enjoy lots of parts that are built into it, and still don't quite understand some parts. So I need a week or so to <laughs> to kind of really get comfy with it. But next week, I think we're going to do a similar episode as we did this week, just on flux. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's um. You know, I think kind of becoming a theme for us in, in episodes, we kind of go through some packages we found uh, or heard about and and start just kind of learning, you know, what's out there and really just trying to get familiar with with the state of the Julia ecosystem. Uh, but yeah, just real quick to wrap things up. Uh, the last thing, you know, a little extra I wanted to mention is JuliaCon 2022. Uh, the registration is now open for that. And so I'm planning on, on attending. Uh, Randy, I'm pretty sure you'll be there as well. Uh, so it is online, uh, all online and virtual only. Um, and tickets are free, but they do want you to register. Uh, and they do request and you should, you know, if you have the means to pay for a ticket, if you have an employer or someone that will pay for that, you know, please, uh, please do pay for the pay for the ticket. But if you don't have the means, it's free, just go register and you can come and you can join us at, uh, at JuliaCon and see all the talks and interact with uh, all the other participants. So Definitely looking forward to that and, and meeting and finally interacting with maybe more of the people that, that are listening to us. Yeah, we need people to interview. I really want to interview more. I want to get to know the community and I want to talk to the people that are behind these packages and just kind of pick their minds about how, when, who, all of these interesting things. And hopefully soon we'll have people to interview. Yeah, I, we've already started reaching out. So that is something that's going to be coming uh, in the future. Well, Randy, thanks again. I, I just look forward to this so much hanging out. Yeah, yeah. Talking about it. Well, take care and uh, we'll see everyone next week. All right. See y'all later.